You are watching With a Cup of Tea, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings. Now, here's our show. Welcome to This House of Books. We have with us today Gwen Florio, who has two books out right now. Uh, they're just fresh on the market. And uh, we're going to talk to her today about these books. Uh, Gwen, maybe... Uh, First of all, you could tell us just a little bit about yourself, and then we'll uh, get into the books. Sure. Um, so I spent most of my career as a journalist, uh, more than 40 years, which is still amazing to say, but probably about halfway through that, I'd always wanted to write fiction. And like a lot of authors, wrote short stories that went nowhere, um, but really got serious when I signed up for a writing workshop in Philadelphia in, I want to say, the early 1990s. And then wrote for another um, close to 20 years before I actually published a novel in 2013, and that was my first novel, Montana. And since then, I've published five in that series featuring a protagonist named Lola Wicks, and then I published a standalone novel about Afghanistan called Silent Hearts. And now, um, through just a weird set of circumstances, I'm writing two different mystery series, one featuring a young public defender named Julia Geary, and another featuring a woman uh, in her early 50s uh, named Nora Best. Well, let's take these books one at a time. Um, so, which one came first? And let's talk about that one. Just a little synopsis of the book. Sure. Um, so, the book that came first is called The Truth of It All, and that's the one featuring the young public defender. Uh, she is a uh, war widow with a little boy, and she, uh, because she has huge debt from law school and she makes almost nothing as a public defender, she's living with her mother in law who blames her uh, for her husband's death and that her husband went into the, the army to help support them and, and got killed in Iraq. And um, so she, she has this tense relationship with her mother-in-law. She has a very stressful, low-paying job, and all she wants is a big case that will bring the attention of a large law firm that maybe will hire her and pay her what she's worth. Unfortunately, the big case she gets involves defending an Iraqi refugee, and he's probably the last person in the world she'd want to defend. And to complicate it, he also is accused of a sex crime. Yes, uh, just to make things even more uh, tough, because uh, the, the both the accused and the young woman, the girl actually accusing him, they're both high school students. He happens to have turned 18, though, which makes him an adult in the eyes of the law. You can imagine what this does if there is an accusation of a sex assault in a high school. You've got the whole town up in arms about this case. Okay. And then the other book. <laughs> Uh, the other book is called Best Kept Secrets, and it's a play on words. My protagonist is Nora Best. It's the second in a series. The first was called Best Laid Plans. And in this one, uh, in the first book, Nora ran into quite a bit of trouble when her marriage broke up, and she hitched up her brand-new Airstream trailer and took off and ended up in the wilds of Wyoming where terrible things happened. So in uh, this book, she has gone back to her home on Maryland's eastern shore uh, to stay with her mom for a while to kind of rest and recoup. But when she is there, there is a police shooting of a young black man, and that brings up uh, memories um, and unearths sort of trouble that happened many, many years earlier in town uh, with a lot of racial unrest. Gwen, I have a soft spot in my heart for journalists turned novelists. <laughs> partly because I'm married to one. <laughs> um, but I, I am also, I observe something with um, novelists who are former journalists, especially stylistically. The writing is so 
clear and concise and and brevity um is the less is more mm-hmm. i find and yet it, it uh they could still be eloquent and descriptive and and sensory and all of that. How does your journalism experience work into your life as a novelist in terms of are you using it in, in that sense of um, and and I'm going to kind of also have a, a little bit of a follow-up question of how do you use that right which you know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't necessarily use that phrase literally but do you, do you find that it informs you even even in terms of just process or deadlines or conceptually thinking of a story or how you pitch even um how does that inform boy those are great questions um i think in terms of the writing i think you make a good point about journalism being a little bit of a stripped down kind of writing, although the longer I worked in journalism, the more I found ways to work in description without being too flowery and going on and on. I think that was uh, something that helped in my fiction. What held me back when I was first writing fiction, um, I got a note from a would-be agent who ended up not being my agent, but he said, this is too journalistic. I had to learn to slow it down go deeper, go deeper into people's emotions, into description, into just like giving people more than that bam, bam, you know, uh, journalism story that's over in 10, 15 minutes of reading, um, if that long. Um, On the plus side, uh, mechanically, I don't get writer's block. I struggle and I get stuck and I get really frustrated but there is no such thing as writer's block in a newsroom. And I think that the great benefit to journalism is I don't have a really romanticized view of writing. Writing is work. Writing is a lot of hard work. And sometimes it's fun work. I mean, journalism was often really, really fun work until you had to sit down and write the story. <laughs> but um, And the same thing with writing fiction. Some days I just I really enjoy it, and some days I just want to tear my hair out. But I know I've got to do it no matter what. So that's that's the mechanical part. And there was another part to your question, but now you have to remind me what it was. Um, this concept of write what you know oh. is, is controversial advice, mm-hmm. I think. Some people think it's the best advice mm-hmm. that you can get have as a writer. Some people, it's the worst right. advice, think it's the worst advice. So I was curious as to where it falls into your canon. Uh, Again, a great question, and I think as I evolve as a writer and hopefully grow, I I write less about what I know. My protagonist in my first series was a journalist, and that was um, important for a couple things. A, I didn't want to screw up writing about a career I didn't know anything about. More to the point, um, journalism is under such stress, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to evangelize a little for journalism and journalists. And, uh, you know, I sort of know the way they work. I wanted to, uh, and I had to make it more exciting than real journalism, which is sitting down looking at a lot of documents a lot of the time. But again, I wanted to portray how journalists work and make it clear to people they don't have fancy offices and wear nice clothes and make big salaries because, boy, is that not true. Um, But as I go on... I enjoy the challenge of researching things, which is a great journalistic skill, about things I don't know. Um, I did cover the beat called Cops and Courts at the Missoulian, uh, which led me to want to write about public defenders. I would see these lawyers come in with just stacks of files and looking so overworked and exhausted. And I thought, man, these poor people. And then I wanted to write about the court system and a lot of inherent unfairness that that at least I thought I was seeing. Um, What I realized when I started to write was that even though I sat in court every day and watched them work, there's a lot about law I don't know. (laughs) So I spent a lot of time on the Google and a lot of time reading, uh, you know, the Montana Code, uh, making sure that I was calling Uh, crimes by their proper names legally. And, you know, murder is actually not a charge in Montana. It's homicide. Um, You don't get charged with murder. 
And I remember writing that once in a newspaper story, and a prosecutor called and raked me over the coals <laughs> for it. So things like that. Yeah. Um, but it is fun to, to put myself in someone else's shoes and figure out what their life is like. And, and again, as I, I hope as I'm growing as a writer, that becomes increasingly more enjoyable. Who, did you have, who do you have in mind as an audience for these books that, you know, as you, I mean, I, I don't want to exclude anybody. Sure. Of course, they're for everyone. Right. But uh, do, you, do you have any particular group in mind? or? Boy, that is a great question. Um, everyone. <laughs> you know, I think um, in both cases, uh, in the case of the truth of it all, in Julia Geary, I was a single mom for many years, and I really drew on that experience. Man, you are always stressed. You are trying to get through your work day and get to daycare as where your child is always the last one to be picked up and, and the daycare people are giving you the stink eye and you're trying to make dinner when it's too late at night to even eat dinner. I mean, just, you know, things are always hard and you're always stressed. So I, I think any any woman, any person, women and men, juggling kids and jobs, mm -hmm. um, that's a really big factor in that book, let alone the legal issues. I think those are interesting, too. And the other one, um, I'm really fond of writing Nora because she's a woman much later in life. Uh, she doesn't have kids, but even if she did, they'd be college age. Uh, she no longer has a husband uh, through some rather horrible circumstances. So she is at a stage in her life where she has some financial security. She has a lot of freedom. And I think that's something people don't think about when they think about women in, in midlife or even later midlife. You know, I think there's a lot of people feeling sorry for them. And, you know, from personal experience, it's a fabulous time of life. <laughs> well, Gwen, I'm going to ask you one more thing uh, uh, related to the bookstore. You've uh, participated with us for quite a while, and you're just, we always just really love to have you down and, and uh, to visit with you, even on Zoom. But uh, I'm wondering... What makes you so interested or involved with a bookstore like ours? Oh, my gosh. Bookstores are treasures. Um, I just... So I, I grew up uh, working in libraries all through high school and college. You know, I, I was a voracious reader, as probably most writers are, and there's something about walking into a room full of books, and you just kind of go, ah, oh, you know, I'm among friends. <laughs> And especially during the pandemic, I think books sustain not just me, but a lot of people. The thing I love about books is the way they take you out of whatever else is happening in your life. It's like magic. Um, you know, I'm going to sound very sentimental, but I just love it. And I love when I find a book where when you get to the end, you're really sorry because you're like, no, now I have to leave these wonderful people. Um, and so, especially independent bookstores are just so part of a community. Um, again, I know that certainly in Missoula, people really rallied to support the bookstore during the pandemic. I, uh, I think that happened here also from what I was yeah. reading on Facebook, which is great. And I just, whenever I go to a town, I find two things. I find the coffee shop and I find the bookstore. So it's a long rambling answer, but I, I hope it made some sense. That's a great answer. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. This has been a production of This House of Books. If you'd like to be a part of the cooperative, please visit thishouseofbooks.com slash get involved.